Essay 1 of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Essay 1. Fate. Delicate omens trace an air to the lone bard true witness bear. Birds and auguries on their wing chanted undeceiving things, him to beckon, him to warn. Well might then the poet scorn to learn of scribe or courier, hence written vaster character, and on his mind at dawn of day soft shadows of the evening lay. For the provision is allied unto the thing so signified, or say, the foresight that awaits is the same genius that creates. It chanced during one winter, a few years ago, that our cities were bent on discussing the theory of the age. By an odd coincidence, four or five noted men were each reading a discourse to the citizens of Boston or New York on the spirit of the times. It so happened that the subject had the same prominence in some remarkable pamphlets and journals issued in London at the same season. To me, however, the question of the time resolved itself into a practical question of the conduct of life. How shall I live? We are incompetent to solve the times. Our geometry cannot span the huge orbits of the prevailing ideas, behold the return, and reconcile their opposition. We can only obey our own polarity. "'Tis fine for us to speculate and elect our course, if we must accept an irresistible dictation. "'In our first steps to gain our wishes, we come upon immovable limitations. "'We are fired with the hope to reform men. "'After many experiments, we find we must begin earlier, at school. "'But the boys and girls are not docile. We can make nothing of them. "'We decide that they are not of good stock. "'We must begin our reform earlier still, at generation. "'That is to say, there is fate, or laws of the world.' but if there be irresistible dictation this dictation understands itself if we must accept fate we are not less compelled to affirm liberty the significance of the individual the grandeur of duty the power of character this is true and that other is true but our geometry cannot span these extreme points and reconcile them what to do by obeying each thought frankly by harping or if you will pounding on each string we learn at last its power with the same obedience to other thoughts we learn theirs and then comes some reasonable hope of harmonizing them. We are sure that, though we know not how, necessity does comport with liberty, the individual with the world, my polarity with the spirit of the times. The rule of the age has for each a private solution. If one would study his own time, it must be by this method of taking up in each turn each of the leading topics which belong to our scheme of human life, and by firmly stating all that is agreeable to experience on one, and doing the same justice to the opposing facts in the others, the true limitations will appear. Any excess of emphasis on one part will be corrected, and a just balance will be made. But let us honestly state the facts. Our America has a bad name for superficialness. Great men, great nations, have not been boasters and buffoons, but perceivers of the terror of life, and have manned themselves to face it. The Spartan, embodying his religion and his country, dies before its majesty, without a question. The Turk, who believes his doom is written on the iron leaf in the moment when he entered the world, rushes on the enemy's saber with undivided will. The Turk, the Arab, the Persian, accepts the foreordained fate. On two days it says not to run from thy grave, the appointed and the unappointed day. On the first neither balm nor physician can save, nor thee on the second the universe slay. The Hindu under the wheel is as firm. Our Calvinists in the last generation had something of the same dignity. They felt that the weight of the universe held them down to their place. What could they do? Wise men feel that there is something which cannot be talked or voted away, a strap or belt which girds the world. The destiny, minister general, that executeth in the world o'er all, the purveyance which God hath seen before, so strong it is, that though the world has sworn the contrary of a thing, it be yea or nay, yet sometimes it shall fall on a day that falleth not often a thousand years, for certainty our appetites here, be it of war, or peace, or hate, or love, all this is ruled by the sight above. Chaucer, The Knight's Tale the greek tragedy expressed the same sense whatever is fated that will take place the great immense mind of jove is not to be transgressed savages cling to a local god of one tribe or town the broad ethics of jesus were quickly narrowed to village theologies which preach an election or favoritism and now and then an amiable person like young stilling or robert huntington believe in epistorian providence which whenever the good man wants a dinner makes it somebody shall knock at his door and leave a half dollar but nature is no sentimentalist, does not cosset or pamper us. We must see that the world is rough and surly, and will not mind drowning a man or woman, but swallows your ship like a grain of dust. The cold inconsiderate of persons tingles your blood, benumbs your feet, freezes a man like an apple. 
the diseases, the elements, fortune, gravity, lightning, respect no persons. The way of providence is a little rude. The habits of snake and spider, the snap of tiger and other leapers and bloody jumpers, the crackle of the bones of his prey and the coil of the anaconda, these are in the system, and our habits are like theirs. We have just dined, and however scrupulously the slaughterhouse is concealed in that graceful distance of miles, there is complicity, expense of races, race living at the expense of race. The planet is liable to shocks from comets, perturbations from planets, rendings from earthquakes and volcanoes, alterations of climate, processions of equinoxes. Rivers dry up by opening up the, of the forest. The sea changes its bed. Towns and counties fall into it. At Lisbon, an earthquake killed men like flies. At Naples, three years ago, ten thousand persons were crushed in a few minutes. The scurvy at sea, the sword, the climate in the west of Africa, at Cayenne, at Panama, at New York, cut off men like a massacre. Our western prairies shake with fever and ague. The cholera, the smallpox, have proved as mortal to some tribes as a frost to the crickets, which, having filled the summer with noise, are silenced by the fall of the temperature of one night. Without uncovering what does not belong to us, or counting how many species of parasites hang on a bamboos, or groping after intestinal parasites, or infusory biters, or the obscurities of alternate generations, the form of the shark, the bilabrus, the jaw of the sea wolf, paved with crushing teeth, the weapons of the grampus, and the warriors hidden in the sea, are hints the ferocity in the interiors of nature. Let us not deny it up and down. Providence is a wild, rough, incalculable road to its end, and is of no use to try to whitewash its huge mixed instrumentalities, or to dress it up with that terrific benefactor of a clean shirt and white neckcloth of a student in divinity. Will you say the disasters which threaten mankind are exceptional, and one need not lay his account for cataclysm of every day? Aye, but what happens once may happen again, and so long as these strokes are not to be parried, they must be feared. But these shocks and ruins are less destructive to us than the stealthy power of other laws which act on us daily. An expensive ends to means is fate, organization tyrannizing over character, menagerie, or forms and powers of the spine is a book of fate. The bill of the bird, the skull of the snake, determines tyrannically its limits. So is the scale of races, of temperaments, so is sex, so is climate, so is the reaction of talent prisoning the vital force in certain directions. Every spirit makes its house, but afterwards the house confines the spirit. The gross lines are legible to the dull. The cabman is phrenologist so far. He looks on your face to see if his shilling is sure. A dome of brow denotes one thing, a pot belly another. A squint, a pug nose, mats of hair, the pigments of the epidermis betray character. People seem sheathed in their tough organization. Ask for Zane, ask the doctors, at Quetelet, if temperaments decide nothing. If there be anything they do not decide, read the description of medical books of the four temperaments, and you will think you are reading your own thoughts which you had not yet told. Find the part which black eyes, which blue eyes play severally in the company. How shall a man escape from his ancestors, or draw from his veins the black drop which he drew from his father's or his mother's life? It often appears in a family, as if all the qualities of the progenitors were potted in several jars, some ruling qualities in each son or daughter in the house, and sometimes the unmixed temperament, that the rank unmitigated elixir, the family vice, is drawn off in a separate individual, and the others are proportionally relieved. We sometimes see a change of expression in our companion, and say, his father or his mother comes to the window of his eyes, and sometimes a remote relative. In different hours, a man represents each of several of his ancestors, as if there were seven or eight of us rolled up in a man's skin. Seven or eight ancestors at least, and they constitute the variety of notes on which the new piece of music which his life is. At the corner of the street, you read the possibility of the passenger, in the facial angle, and the complexion, in the depth of his eye. His parentage determines it men are what their mothers made them. You may as well ask a loom which weaves huckabuck why it does not make cashmere, or expect poetry from this engineer, or a chemical discovery from that jobber. Ask the digger in the ditch to explain Newton's law. The fine organs of his brain have been pinched by overwork and squalid poverty from father to son for hundreds of years. When each comes forth from his mother's womb, the gate of gifts closes behind him. Let him value his hands and feet. He has but one pair." but he has but one future and that is already predetermined in his lobes it describes in that little fatty face pig eye and squat form all the privilege and all the legislation of the world cannot meddle or help to make a poet or a prince of him jesus said when he looketh on her he hath committed adultery but he is an adulterer before he has yet looked on the woman by the superfluity of the animal and the defect of the thought in his constitution who meets him or who meets her in the street sees that they are ripe for each other's victim in certain men, digestion and sex absorb the vital force, and the stronger these are, the individual is so much weaker. The more of these drones perish, the better for the hive. 
If later they give birth to some superior individual, with force enough to add to his animal a new aim and a complete apparatus to work it out, all the ancestors are gladly forgotten. Most men and women are merely one couple more. Now and then one is a new cell of Camarilla, open in his brain, an architectural, musical, or philological knack, some stray taste or talent for flowers, or chemistry, or pigments, or storytelling, a good hand for drawing, a good foot for dancing, an athletic frame for wide journeying, etc., which skill no wise alters rank in the scale of nature, but serves to pass the time, the life of sensation goes on as before. At last, these hints and tendencies are fixed in one, or in a succession, each absorbs so much food and force as to become itself a new center. The new talent draws off so rapidly the vital force that not enough remains for the animal functions, hardly enough for health, so that in the second generation, if the like genius appears, the health is visibly deteriorated and the generative force impaired. People are born with a moral or with a material bias, uterine brothers with a diverging destination. I suppose with high magnifiers, the Fraunhofer or Carpenter might come to distinguish in the embryo of the fourth day, this is a wig, that a free soiler. It was a poetic attempt to lift this mountain of fate, to reconcile this despotism of race and liberty, which led the Hindus to say, fate is nothing but the deeds committed in the prior state of existence. I find the coincidence of the extremes of Eastern and Western speculation in the daring statement of Schelling, there is in every man a certain feeling that he has been what he is from all eternity, and by no means from such in time. To say it less sublimely, the history of the individual is always an account of his condition, and he knows himself to be party to his estate. A good deal of our politics is physiological. Now and then, a man of wealth in the heyday of youth adopts the tenet of broadest freedom. In England, there is always some man of wealth and large connection planting himself during all his years of health on the side of progress, who, as soon as he begins to die, checks his forward play, calls in his troops, and becomes conservative. All conservatives are such from personal defects. They have been effeminated by position or nature, born halt and blind, the luxury of their parents, and can only, like invalids, act on the defensive. But strong natures, backwoodsmen, New Hampshire giants, Napoleons, Burks, Browns, Websters, Kassuths, are inevitable patriots until their life ebbs and their defects and gout, palsy and money, warp them. The strongest idea incarnates itself in majorities and nations, and the healthiest and strongest. Probably the election goes by a vorpitous weight, and if you could weigh bodily the tonnage of any hundred of the Whigs and Democratic Party in a town, on the Dearborn balance, as he passed the hay scales, you could predict with certainty which party would carry it. On the whole, it would be rather the speediest way of deciding the vote, to put the selectmen or the mayor and aldermen on the hay scales. In science, we have to consider two things, power and circumstance. All we know of the egg, from each successive discovery, is another vesicle. And if, after five hundred years, you got a better observer, or a better glass, he finds within the last observer another. In vegetable and animal tissues, it is just alike, and all that the primary power of spasm operates is still vesicle, vesicle. Yes, but the tyrannical circumstance, a vesicle and a new circumstance, a vesicle lodged in darkness, oaken thought, becomes animal. In light, a plant, lodged in the parent animal, it suffers changes, which ends in unsheathing miraculous capability in the unaltered vesicle, and unlocks itself to fish, bird, quadruped, head and foot, eye and claw. The circumstance is nature. Nature is what you may do. There is much you may not. We have two things, the circumstance and life. Once we thought, positive power was all. Now we learn that negative power or circumstance is half. Nature is the tyrannous circumstance, the thick skull, the sheathed snake, the ponderous, rock-like jaw, necessitated activity, the violent direction, the conditions of a tool, like the locomotive, strong enough on its track, but which can do nothing but mischief off of it, or skates, which are wings on the ice, but fetters on the ground. The book of nature is the book of fate. She turns the gigantic pages, leaf after leaf, never returning one. One leaf she lays down, a floor of granite, then a thousand ages, and a bed of slate. A thousand ages in a measure of coal, a thousand ages in a layer of marl and mud. Vegetable forms appear, her first mishappened animal, zoophyte, trilobium, fish, then saurons, rude forms, in which she has only blocked her future statute, concealing under these unwieldy monsters the fine type of her coming king. The face of the planet cools and dries, the races meliorate, the man is born, and when he race has lived its term, it comes no more again. The population of the world is a conditional population, not the best, but the best that could live now. The scales of tribes, and the steadiness with which victory adheres to one tribe, and defeat to another, is as uniform as the superposition of strata. We know in history that weight belongs to race. We see the English, French, and Germans planting themselves on every shore and market of America and Australia, monopolizing the commerce of these countries. We like the nervous and victorious habit of our own branch of the family. 
we follow the step of the Jew, of the Indian, of the Negro, we see how much will still be expended to extinguish the Jew, in vain. Look at the impalatable conclusions of Knox in his fragment of races. A rash and satisfactory writer, but charged with pungent and forgettable truths. Nature respects race, not hybrids. Every race has its own habitat. Detach a colony from its race, and it deteriorates to the crab. See the shades of the picture. The German and Irish millions, like the Negro, have a great deal of guano on their destiny. They ferried over the Atlantic and carted all over America to ditch and drudge, to make corn cheap, and then to lie prematurely to make a spot of green grass on the prairie. One more faggot of these adamantian bandages is the new science of statistics, it is a rule that the most casual and extraordinary events, if the basis of population is broad enough, become matter of fixed calculation. It would not be safe to say that the captain like Bonaparte, a singer like Jenny Lynn, or a navigator like Bodworth would be born in Boston, but, on a population of twenty or two hundred millions, something like accuracy may be had. Tis frivolous to fix pedantically the date of particular inventions. They have all been invented over and over fifty times. Man is the ark machine, of which all these shifts draw from himself are toy models. He helps himself on each emergency by copying or duplicating his structure, just so far as the need is. It is hard to find the right Homer, Zoroaster, or Menu. Harder still to find the Tubal Cain, or Vulcan, or Cadmus, or Copernicus, or Fuse, or Fulton, the indisputable inventor. There are scores and centuries of them. The air is full of men. This kind of talent so abounds, this constructive tool-making efficiency, as if it adhered to the chemical atoms, as if the air he breathes were of Volkansons, Franklins, and Watts. Doubtless in every million there would be an astronomer, a mathematician, a comic poet, a mystic. No one can read the history of astronomy without perceiving that Copernicus, Newton, Laplace are not new men, or a new kind of men, but that Thales, Anaximenes, Hipparchus, Empedocles, Aristarchus, Pythagoras, and Apides had anticipated them, each of the same geometrical mind, apt for the same vigorous computational logic, a mind parallel to the movement of the world. The Roman mile probably rested on a measure of a degree of the meridian. Mahatman and Chinese know of, of the leap year, of the Gregorian calendar, of the procession of equinoxes. As in every barrel of cowries brought to New Bedford, there shall be one orangia, so there will be in a dozen millions of Malays and Mahatmans, one or two astronomical skulls. In large city, the most casual things, the things whose beauty lie in their casualty, are produced as punctually and to order as a baker's muffin for breakfast. Punch makes exactly one capital joke a week, and the journals contrive to furnish one good piece of news every day. Not less work the laws of repression, the penalties of violated functions. Famine, typhus, frost, war, suicide, effete races must be reckoned calculable parts of the system of the world. These are pebbles from the mountain, hints of the terms by which our life is walled up, and which show a kind of mechanical exactness, or a loom or mill, in which we call casual or fortuitous events. The force with which we resist these torrents of tendency looks so ridiculously inadequate that it amounts to little more than the criticism of a protest made of a minority of one under compulsions of millions. I seemed, in the height of a tempest, to see men overboard struggling in the waves, and driven about here and there. They glanced intelligently at each other, but t'was little they could do for one another. T'was much if they could keep afloat alone, while well, they had a right to their eye beams, and all the rest was fate. I cannot trifle with this reality, this cropping out in our planted gardens in the core of the world. No picture of life can have any veracity that does not admit the odious facts. A man's power is hooped in by necessity, which, by many experiments, he touches on every side until he learns his arc. The element running through entire nature, which we popularly call fate, is known to us as limitation. Whatever limits us, we call fate. If we are brute and barbarous, the fate takes a brute and dreadful shape. As we refine, our checks become finer we rise to spiritual culture, the antagonism takes a spiritual form. In the Hindu fables, Vishnu follows Maya through all her ascending changes, from insect to crawfish, up to elephant. Whatever form she took, he took the male form of the kind, until she became at last woman and goddess, and he a man and god. The limitations refine as the soul purifies, but the ring of necessity is always perched at the top. When the gods in the north's heaven were unable to bind the Fenris wolf, with steel or with weight of mountains, the one he snapped and the other he spurned with his heel. They put on his foot a limp band softer than silk or cobweb, and this held him. The more he spurned it, the stiffer it grew. So soft and so staunch is the ring of fate. Neither brandy nor nectar, nor sulfuric ether, nor hellfire, nor ichor, nor poetry, nor genius can get rid of this limp band. For if we give it the high sense in which the poets use it, even thought is itself not above fate. That too must act according to eternal laws, and all that is willful and fantastic in it is in opposition to its fundamental essence. And, last of all, high over thought, in the world of morals, fate is vindicator. 
leveling the high, lifting the low, requiring justice in man, and always striking soon or late when justice is not done. What is useful will last, what is hurtful will sink. The doer must suffer, said the Greeks. He would soothe the deity not to be soothed. God himself cannot procure good for the wicked, said the Welsh triad. God may consent, but only for a time, said the bard of Spain. The limitation is impassable by any insight of man. In his last and loftiest ascensions, insight itself, and the freedom of the will, is one of its obedience members, but we must not run its generalizations too large, but show the natural bounds of our essential distinctions, and seek to do justice to the other elements as well. Thus we trace fate in matter, mind, and morals, in race and retardations of strata, and in thought and character as well. It is everywhere bound or limitation, but fate has its lord, limitation its limits, is different seen from above and from below, from within and from without. For though fate is immense, so is power, which is the other fact in the dual world, immense. If fate follows the limits power, power attempts and antagonizes fate. We must respect fate as natural history, but there is more than natural history. For who and what is this criticism that pries into the matter? Man is not order of nature, sack and sack, belly and members, link in a chain, nor any ignominious baggage, but a stupendous antagonism, a dragging together the poles of the universe. He betrays the relation to what is below him. Thick-skulled, small-brained, fishy, quadrominous, crowded by ill disguise, hardly escaped into biped, and has paid for the new powers by loss of some of the old ones. The lightning which explodes and fashions planets, maker of planets and suns, is in him. On one side, elemental order, sandstone, granite, rock ledges, peat bog, forest, sea and shore. On the other part, thought, the spirit which composes and decomposes nature. Here they are, side by side, God and devil, mind and matter, king and conspirator, belt and spasm, riding peacefully together in the eye and brain of every man. Nor can he blink the free will. To hazard the contradiction, freedom is necessary. If you please to plant yourself on the side of fate, and say, fate is all, then we say, part of fate is the freedom of man. Forever wells up the impulse to choosing and acting in the soul. Intellect annuls fate. So far as a man thinks, he is free. And though nothing is more disgusting than the crowing about liberty by slaves, as most men are, and the flippant mistaking for freedom of some paper preamble like the Declaration of Independence, or the statute right to vote, by those who have never dared to think or to act, it is wholesome to man to look not at fate, but at the other way, the practical view is the other. His sound relation to these facts is to use and command, not to cringe to them. Look not on nature, for her name is fatal, said the oracle. Too much contemplation on these limits induces meanness. They will talk much of destiny, their birth stars, etc., are in a lower dangerous plane, and invite the evils they fear. I cited the instinctive and heroic races as proud believers in destiny. They conspire with it. A loving resignation is with the event. But the dogma makes a different impression when it is held by the weak and lazy. Tis weak and vicious people who cast the blame on fate. The right use of fate is to bring up our conduct to the loftiness of nature. Rude and invincible except by themselves are the elements. So let man be. Let him empty his breast of his windy conceits, and show his lordship by manners and deeds on the scale of nature. Let him hold his purpose as with a tug of gravitation. No power, no persuasion, no bribe shall make him give up his point. A man ought to compare advantageously with a river, an oak, or a mountain. He should not have not less the flow, the expansion, the resistance of these. "'Tis the best use of fate to teach a fatal courage. Go face the fire at sea, or the cholera in your friend's house, or the burglar in your own, or what danger lies in the way of duty, knowing you are guarded by the cherubim of destiny. If you believe in fate to your harm, believe it at least for your good. For if fate is so prevailing, man also is part of it, and can confront fate with fate. If the universe have these savage accidents, our atoms are as savage in resistance. We should be crushed by the atmosphere, but for the reaction of the air within our body.' A tube made of a film of glass can resist the shock of the ocean, if filled with the same water. If there be omnipotence in the stroke, there is omnipotence of recoil. 1. But fate against fate is only pairing defense. There are also the noble creative forces. The revelation of thought takes man out of servitude into freedom. We rightly say of ourselves, we are born, and afterwards, we are born again, and many times. We have successful experiences so important that the new forgets the old, and hence the mythology of the seven or nine heavens. The day of days, the great day of the feast of life, is that in which the inward eye opens the unity in things, the omnipresence of laws. Sees that what is must be, and ought to be, or is the best. The beatitude dips from on high down on us, and we see. It is not, on, it is not in us so much as we are in it. If the air come to our lungs, we breathe and live. If not, we die. If the light comes to our eyes, we see, else not. 
and if truth come to our mind we suddenly expand to its dimensions as if we grew to worlds we are as lawgivers we speak for nature we prophesy and divine this insight throws us on the party interests of the universe against all and sundry against ourselves as much as others a man speaking from insights affirms of himself what is true of the mind seeing its immortality he says i am immortal seeing its invincibility he says i am strong it is not in us but we are in it. it is not of the maker not of what is made all things are touched and changed by it this uses and is not used it distances those who share it from those who share it not those who share it not are flocks and herds it dates from itself not from former men or better men gospel or constitution or college or custom where it shines nature is no longer intrusive but all things make a musical or pictorial impression the world of men shows like a comedy without laughter populations interests governments history this is all toy figures in a toy house it does not overvalue particular truths we hear eagerly every thought and word quoted by an intellectual man but in his presence our own mind is roused to activity and we forget very fast what he says much more interested in the new play of our own thought than any thought of his tis the majesty into which we have suddenly mounted the impersonality the scorn of egotisms the sphere of laws that engage us once we were stepping a little this way and a little that way now we are as men in a balloon and do not think so much of the point we had left or the point we would make as of the liberty and glory of the way just as much intellect as you add so much organic power he who sees through the design presides over it and must will that which must be we seek and rule and though we sleep our dream will come to pass our thought though it were an hour old affirms an oldest necessity not to be separated from thought and not to be surpassed and not to be separated from will they must always have coexisted it prizes us of its sovereignty and godhead which refuses to be severed from it. it is not mine or thine but the will of all mind it is poured into the souls of all men as the soul itself which constitutes them men i know not whether there be as is alleged in the upper region of our atmosphere a permanent westerly current which carries all its atoms which rise to that height but i see that when a soul reaches a certain clearness of perception they accept a knowledge and motive above selfishness a breath of will breathes eternally through the universe of souls in the direction of right and necessary it is the air which all intellects inhale and excel it is the wind which blows the worlds into orbit and orbit thought dissolves the material universe by carrying the mind up into a sphere where all is plastic of two men each obeying his own thought he whose thought is deepest will be the stronger character always one man more than another represents the will of divine providence to the period two if thoughts make free so does the moral sentiment the mixtures of spiritual chemistry refuse to be analyzed yet we can see that the perception of truth is joined to the desire that it shall prevail that affection is essential to will moreover when a strong will appears it usually results from a certain unity of organization as if the whole energy of the body and mind flowed in one direction all great force is real and elemental there is no manufacturing a strong will there must be a pound to balance a pound where power is shown in the will it must rest on the universal force alaric and bonaparte must believe they rest on a truth or they can be bought or bent there is a bribe and possibility for any finite will but the pure sympathy with universal ends is an infinite force and cannot be bribed or bent whoever has had experience in the moral sentiment cannot choose but believe its unlimited power each pulse from that heart is an oath from the most high i know not the world's sublime means if it is not intimations of this infinite of a terrific force a text of heroism a name and an anecdote of courage are not arguments but sallies of freedom one of these is the verse of the persian hafiz tis written on the gate of heaven woe unto him who suffers himself to be betrayed by fate does the reading of history make us fatalists what courage does not the opposite opinion show a little whim of will will be free gallantly contending against the universe of chemistry but insight is not will nor is affection will perception is cold and goodness dies in wishes as voltaire says tis the misfortune of worthy people that they are cowards there must be a fusion of these two to generate the energy of will there can be no deriving force except through the conversion of man into his will making him the will and the will him let me say boldly that no man has the right to perception of any truth who has not been reacted on by it so as to be ready to be its martyr the one serious and formal thing in nature is a will society is servile for want of will and therefore the world wants saviors and religions one way is right to go the hero sees it and moves down that aim and that the world under him for root and support he is to others as the world his approbation is honor his descent infamy the glance of his eye has the force of sunbeams a personal influence towers up in memory and only worthy we gladly forget numbers money climate gravitation and the rest of fate 
We cannot afford to allow the limitation. If we know it is the limiter of the growing man, we stand against fate, as children stand against the wall in their father's house, and notch their height from year to year. When the boy grows to man and is master of the house, he pulls down that wall and builds a newer and bigger. It is only a question of time. Every great youth is in training to ride and rule his dragon. His science is to make weapons and wings of these passions and retarding forces. Now, whether seeing these two things, fate and power, we are permitted to believe in unity? The bulk of mankind believe in two gods. They under one dominion here in the house, as friend and parent, in social circles, in letters, in art and love, in religion. But in mechanics, in dealing with steam and climate, in trade, in politics, they think they come under another, and that it would be practical blunder to transfer the methods of ways of working of one sphere to the other. What good, honest, generous men at home will be wolves and foxes on change? What pious men in the parlor will vote for reprobates at the polls? To a certain point, they believe themselves in the care of providence, but in a steamboat, in an epidemic, in war, they believe in malignant energy rules. But relation and connection are not somewhere and sometimes, but everywhere and always. The divine order does not stop where sight stops. The friendly powers work on the same rules, on the same farm, on the next planet. But where they have not experienced, they run against it and hurt themselves. Fate, then, is named for facts not yet passed under the fire of thought, for causes which are unpenetrated. But every jet of chaos which threatens to exterminate us is convertible by intellect into wholesome force. Fate is unpenetrated causes. The water drowns ship and sailor are like a grain of dust. But learn to swim, trim your bark, and the wave which drowned it will be cloven by it and carry it like its own foam, a plume and a power. The cold is inconsiderate of persons, tingles your blood, freezes a man like a dewdrop. But learn to skate, and the ice will give you a graceful, sweet, and poetic motion. The cold will brace your limbs and brain to genius, and make you foremost men of time. Cold and sea will train an imperial Saxon race, where nature cannot bear to lose, and after cooping it up for thousands of years, yonder Eglin gives a hundred Englands, a hundred Mexicos. All the bloods it shall absorb and domineer, and more than Mexicos, the secret of water and steam, the spasm of electricity, the ductility of metals, the chariot of the air, the rudder balloon are waiting for you. The annual slaughter from typhus far exceeds that of war, but right drainage destroys typhus. The plagues in the sea service from scurvy is healed by lemon juice and other diets portable and procurable. The depopulation by cholera and smallpox is ended by drainage and vaccination, and every other pest is not less in the chain of cause and effect, and may be fought off. And whilst arts draw out the venom, it commonly extorts some benefit from the vanquished enemy. The mischievous torrent is taught to drudge for man, the wild beast he makes for useful food or dress or labor. The chemic explosions are controlled like his watch. They are now the seeds which he rides. Man moves on all modes, by legs of horses, by wings of wind, by steam, by gas of balloon, by electricity, and stands on tiptoe, threatening to hunt the eagle in his own element. There is nothing he will not make his own carrier. Steam was, till the other day, the devil which he dreaded. Every pot made by a human potter or brazier was a hole in his cover, to let off the enemy, lest he should lift pot and roof, and carry the house away. But the Marquis of Walchester, Watt and Fulton, bethought themselves that where was power was not devil, but was God that it must be availed of, and not by any means let off and wasted. Could he lift pot and roof and houses so handily? He was a workman we were in search for. He would be used to lift away, chain, and compel other devils, far more reluctant and dangerous, namely, cubic miles of earth, mountains, weight of resistance of water, machinery, and the labors of all men in the world. In time he shall lengthen and shorten space. It is not fared much otherwise with higher kinds of steam. The opinion of millions was a terror of the world, and it was attempted either to dissipate them by amusing nations, or to pile it over with strata of society, a layer of soldiers, over that a layer of lords, and a king on top, with clamps and hoops and castles and garrisons and police. But sometimes the religious principle would get out and burst the hoops, and arrive every mountain laid on top of it. The Fultons and Watts of politics, believing in unity, saw that it was a power, and by satisfying it, as just as satisfies everybody, through a different disposition of society, grouping it on a level instead of piling it into a mountain, they have contrived to make of this terror the most harmless and energetic form of state. Very odious, I confess, are the lessons of fate. Who likes to have a dapper phrenologist pronouncing on his fortunes? Who likes to believe that he has hidden in his skull, spine, and pelvis all the vices of Saxon or Celtic race, which will be sure to pull him down, with the grandeur of hope and resolve he has fired, into a selfish, huckstering, servile, dodging animal? A learned physician tells us the fact is invariable with the Neapolitan that, when mature, he assumes the forms of the unmistakable scoundrel. That is a little overstated, but it may pass. But these are magazines and arsenals. A man must thank his defects and stand in some terror at his talents. A transcendent talent draws so largely on his forces as to lame it. A defect pays him revenues on the other side. Sufferance, which is the badge of the Jew, has made him, in these days, the ruler of the rulers of the earth. 
If fate is or in quarry, if evil is good and in the making, if limitation is power that shall be, if calamities, oppositions, and ways or wings means, we are reconciled. Fate involves amelioration. No statement of the universe can have any soundness which does not admit its ascending effort. The direction of the whole and of the parts is toward benefit and in proportion to the health. Behind every individual closes the organization. Before him, open liberty. The better, the best. The first and worst races are dead. The second and perfect races are dying out or remain for the maturing of higher. In the latest race, in man, every generosity, every new perception, and love and praise he extorts from his fellows are certificates of advance out of fate into freedom. Liberation of the will from the sheaths and clogs of organization which he has outgrown is the end and aim of the world. Every calamity is a spur and valuable hint. And whereas endeavors do not fully avail, they tell his tendency. The whole circle of life, tooth against tooth, devouring war, war for food, a yelp of pain and a grunt of triumph, and at last the whole menagerie, the whole chemical mass, is mellowed and refined for higher use. Pleases that a sufficient perspective. But to see how fate slides into freedom, and freedom into fate, observe how far the roots of every man run, or find, if he can, a point where there is no thread of connection. Our life is constantaneous and far related. The snout of nature is so well tied, and nobody has ever had the cunning enough to find the two ends. Nature is intricate, overlapped, interweaved, and endless. Christopher Wren said of the beautiful King's College Chapel that if anybody would tell him where to lay the first stone, he would build another. Where shall we find the first atom in this house of man, which is all constant inosculation and balance of parts? The web of relation is shown in habitat, shown in hibernation. When hibernation was observed, it was found that, while some animals become torpid in winter, others were torpid in summer. Hibernation, then, was a false name. The long sleep is not an effective cold, but is regulated by the supply of proper food for the animal. It becomes torpid when the fruit or prey it lives on is not in season, and regains its activity when its food is ready. Eyes are found in light, ears in auricular air, feet on land, fins in water, wings in air, and each creature where it was meant to be, with a mutual fitness. Every zone has its own fauna, there is adjustment between the animal and its food, its parasite, its enemy. Balances are kept. It is not allowed to diminish in numbers, nor to exceed. The like adjustments exist for man. His food is cooked when he arrived, his coal in the pit, the house ventilated, the mud of the deluge dried, his companions arrived at the same hour, and awaiting him with love, concert, laughter, and tears. These are coarse adjustments, but the invisible are not less. There are more belongings to every creature than his air and his food. His instincts must be met, and he has a predisposing power that bends and fits what is near to him to his use. He is not possible until the invisible things are right for him, as well as the visible. Of what changes then in sky and earth, and in finer skies and earths, does the appearance of some Dante or Columbus surprise us? How is this affected? Nature is no spendthrift, but takes the shortest way to her ends. As the general says to the soldiers, if you want a fort, build a fort, so nature makes every creature do its own work and get its living. Is it planet, animal, or tree? The planet makes itself. The animal cell makes itself, and what it wants. Every creature, run or dragon, shall make it its own lair. So soon as there is life, there is self-direction and absorbing and using of material. Life is freedom, life in the direct ratio of its amount. You may be sure that the newborn man is not inert. Life works both voluntary and supernaturally in its neighborhood. You suppose he can be assimilated by his weight or pounds, or that he is contained in his skin, this reaching, radiating, ejaculating fellow? The smallest candle fills a mile with its rays, and the papillae of man runs to every star. When there is something to be done, the world knows how to get it done. The vegetable eye makes leaf pyrocarp, root, bark, and thorn, as the need is. The first cell converts itself into stomach, mouth, nose, or nail. According to the want, the world throws its life into a hero or shepherd, and puts him where he is wanted. Dante and Columbus were Italians in their time. They would be Russians or Americans today. Things ripen, new men come. The adaptation is not capricious. The alter aim, the purpose beyond itself, the correlation by which planets subside and crystallize, then animate beast animal, will not stop, but will work into finer particulars, and from the finer to the finest. The secret of the world is the tie between person and event. Person makes event, the event, person, the times, the age, what is that, but a few profound persons and a few active persons who epitomize the times, Goethe, Hegel, Metternich, Adams, Calhoun, Gazoo, Peel, Cobden, Kasuth, Rothschild, Astor, Bunnell, and the rest. The same fitness must be resumed a man in the time and event, as between the sexes, or between a race of animals and the food it eats, or the inferior races it uses. He thinks his fate alien, because the copula is hidden. But the soul contains the event that shall befall it, for the event is only the actualization of its thoughts, and what we pray to ourselves for is always granted. The event is a print of your form. It fits you like your skin. 
what Jesus does is proper to him. Events of the children of the body and mind, we learn of the soul of fate as the soul of us, as if he sings. Alas, to all I had not known, my guide and fortune's guides are one. All the toys that infatuate men, and which they play for, houses, land, money, luxury, power, fame, are the self-same thing, with a new gauze or two of illusion overlaid, and of the drums and rattles by which men are made willing to have their heads broken, and are led out soundly every morning to parade, the most admirable is this by which we are brought to believe that events are arbitrary and independent of actions. At the conjurer's we detect the hair by which he moves his puppet, but we have not yet eyes sharp enough to descry the thread that ties cause and event. Nature magically suits the man to his fortune by making these the fruits of his character. Ducks take to the water, eagles to the sky, waders to the sea margin, hunters to the forest, clerks to the conning room, soldiers to the frontier. Thus events grow on the same stem with persons, our subpersons. The pleasures of life are according to the man that lives it, and not according to the work of the place. Life is an ecstasy. We know that madness belongs to love. What power to paint a vile object in hues of heaven. As insane persons are indifferent to their dress, diet, or other accommodations, and as we do in dreams, with, equ with equanimity, the most absurd act, so the drop more of wine or a cup of life will reconcile us to the strange company and work. Each creature puts forth its, from itself its own condition and sphere, as the slug sweats its slimy house on the pearl leaf, and the woolly aphids on the apple perspire their bone bed, and the fish its shell. In youth we clothe ourselves in rainbows, and go as brave as the zodiac. In age we put on another sort of perspiration, gout, fever, rheumatism, caprice, doubt, fretting, and avarice. A man's fortunes are the fruit of his character. A man's friends are his magnetisms. We go to Herodotus and Plutarch for examples of fate. But we are examples. The tendency of every man to enact all that is in his constitution is expressed in the old belief, that the effort by which we make to escape from our destiny only serves to lead us into it. And I have noticed, a man likes better to be complimented in his position, as a proof of the last or total excellence, than on his merit. A man will see his character omitted in the events that seem to meet, but which exude from and accompany him. Events expand from the character. As once he found himself among toys, so now he plays a part in the colossal systems, and his growth is declared in his ambition, his companions, in his performance. He looks like a piece of luck, but is a piece of causation, the mosaic angulated and ground to fit into the gap he fills. Hence, in each town, there is some man who, in his brains and performance, an explanation of the tillage, production, factories, banks, churches, ways of living, and society of that town. If you do not chance to meet him, all that you see will leave you a bit puzzled. If you see him, it will become plain. We know in Massachusetts who built New Bedford, who built Lynn, Lowell, Lawrence, Clinton, Fickburg, Holyoke, Partland, and a many other noisy mart. Each of these men, if they were transparent, would seem to you not so much as men as walking cities. Wherever you put them, they would build one. History is the action and reaction of these two, nature and thought. Two boys pushing each other on the curbstone of the pavement. Everything is pushed and pusher, and matter and mind are in perpetual tilt and balance so. Whilst the man is weak, the earth takes up him. He plants his brain in affectations. By and by he takes up the earth, and half his garden and vineyards in the beautiful order and production of his thought. Every solid on the earth is ready to become fluid on the approach of the mind, and the power of the flux is in the measure of the mind. If the wall remain adamant, it accuses the want of thought. To a subtler thought, it may stream into new forms, expressive of the character of the mind. What is the city in which we sit here but an aggregate of incongruous materials which have obeyed the will of some man? The granite was reluctant, but his hands were stronger, and it came. Iron was deep in the ground, and well combined with stone, but it could not hide from his fires. Wood, lime, stuffs, fruit, gums were disposed over the earth and sea, in vain. Here they are within reach of every man's day labor, what he wants of them. The whole world is the flux of matter over the wires of thought to the poles and points where it would build. The races of men rise out of the ground, preoccupied with the thoughts which rule them, and divided into parties, ready, armed, and angry to fight for this metaphysical abstraction. The quality of the thought differences the Egyptian and the Roman, the Austrian and the American. The men who come on the stage at one period are all found to be related to each other. Certain ideas are in the air. We are all impressionable, and we are made of them. All impressionable, but some more than others, and these first express them. This explains the curious contemporaneousness of inventions and discoveries. The truth is in the air, and the most impressionable brain will announce it first, but all will announce it a few minutes later. So women, as most susceptible, are the best index of the coming hour. So the great man, that is, the man most imbued with the spirit of the time, is the impressionable man, of a fiber irritable and delicate, like iodine delight. He feels the infinitesimal attractions. His mind is righter than others, because he yields to a current so feeble as can be felt only by a needle delicately poised. 
The correlation is shown in defects. Moiler, in his essay on architecture, taught the building which was fitted accurately to answer its ends would be turned out to be beautiful, though beauty had not been attended. I find the like unity in human structures rather violent and pervasive. That crudity in the blood will appear in the argument. A hump in the shoulder will appear in the speech and the handwork. If this mind could be seen, the hump would be seen. If a man has a seesaw on his voice, it will run into his sentences, into his poem, into the structure of his fable, into his speculation, into his charity. And as every man is hunted by his own daemon, vexed by his own disease, this checks all of activity. So each man, like each plant, has his parasites. A strong, astringent, bilious nature has more truculent enemies than the slugs and moss that fret my leaves. Such a one has curculios, borers, knife worms. A swindler ate him first, then a client, then a quack, then smooth, plausible gentleman, bitter, selfish as Moloch. This correlation really existing can be divined. If the threads are there, thought can follow and show them, especially when a soul is quick and docile, as Chaucer sings. Or if the soul of proper kind be so perfect as men find, that it wot what is to come, that he warneth all in some of every of their adventures, by have provisions and figures, that our flesh hath not might to it to understand or write, for it is worn too darkly. Some people are made up of rhyme, coincidence, omen, curiosity, and presage. They meet the person they seek. What their companion prepares to say to them, they first say to him, a hundred signs apprise them of what is about to befall. Wonderful intricacy in the web, wonderful constancy in the design this vagabond life admits. We wonder how the fly finds its mate, and yet year after year we find two men, two women, without legal or carnal right, spend a great part of their best time together within a few feet of each other. And the moral is that what we seek we shall find. What we flee from flees from us. As Goethe said, what we wish for our youth comes to us in heaps in old age, too often cursed with the granting of our prayer, and hence the high caution that since we are sure of having what we wish, we beware of only wishing for high things. One key, one solution to the mysteries of human condition, one solution to the old knots of fate, freedom of knowledge, exists, the propounding, namely, of the double consciousness. A man must ride alternately on the horses of his private and his public nature, as the equestrians of the circus throw themselves nimbly from horse to horse, or plant one foot on the back of one and the other foot on the back of the other. So a man is victim of his fate, his sciatica in his loins, the cramp in his mind, a club foot and a club in his wit, a sour wit and a selfish temper, a strut in his gait, and a conceit in his affectation or is ground to powder by the vice of his race, he is to rally on his relation to the universe, which his ruin benefits. Leaving the daemon who suffers, he is to take sides with the deity, who secures universal benefit by his pain. To offset the drag of temperament and race, which pulls down, learn this lesson, namely, that by the cunning co-presence of two elements, which is throughout nature, whatever lames or paralyzes you, draws in with it the divinity of some form to repay. A good intention clothes itself with sudden power, when a god wishes to ride, any chip or pebble will bud and shoot out winged feet and serve him for a horse. Let us build altars to blessed unity, which holds nature and souls in perfect solution, and compels every atom to serve in a universal end. Or not wonder at the snowflake, a shell, a summer landscape, or the glory of the stars, but at the necessity of beauty under which the universe lies, that all is and must be pictorial, that the rainbow and the curve of the horizon and the arc of the blue vault are only results from the organism of the eye. There is no need for foolish amateurs to fetch me to admire a garden of flowers, or a sun-gilt cloud, or a waterfall, when I cannot look without seeing splendor and grace. How idle to choose a random sparkle here or there, when the indwelling necessity plants the rose of beauty on the brow of chaos, and discloses the central intention of nature to be harmony and joy. Let us build altars to the beautiful necessity. If we thought men were free in the sense that, in a single exception, one fantastical will could prevail over the law of things, it were all one as if a child's hand could pull down the sun. If, in the least particular, one could derange the order of nature, who would accept the gift of life? Let us build altars to the beautiful necessity, which secures that all is made of one piece, that plaintiff and defendant, friend and enemy, animal and planet, food and eater are of one kind. In astronomy is vast space, but no foreign system. In geology, vast time, but the same loss as today. Why should we be afraid of nature, which is no other than philosophy and theology embodied, why should we fear to be crushed by savage elements, we who are made up of the same elements? Let us build to the beautiful necessity, which makes men brave in believing that he cannot shun a danger that is appointed, nor incur one that is not, to the necessity which rudely or softly educates them to the perception that there are no contingencies, that law rules throughout existence, a law which is not intelligent, but intelligence, not personal nor impersonal, it disdains words and passes understanding, it dissolves persons, it vivifies nature, it solicits the pure in heart to draw on all its omnipotence. 
End of Fate. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Visit my website at www.perfectidius.com. That's perfect, I-D-I-U-S, dot com.